You're listening to Wild Things and Wild Places, a Muley Fanatic Foundation podcast that aims to discuss issues and efforts related to the Muley Fanatic Foundation mission, the conservation of mule deer, furthering the sport of hunting, and sound wildlife management. Everybody knows I'm a Muley Fanatic. It's time for Wild Things and Wild Places. And here's your guide, Joshua Corsi. And welcome to another episode of Wild Things in Wild Places. Joining me today, I've got Scott Hample, Director of Operations for Muley Fanatic Foundation from Colorado. Welcome, Scott. Hey, Josh. Good to hear from you. Yeah, great to hear from you. As uh, you and I both know, something we've been watching closely, have talked about quite a bit, started in the spring with a visit with Dan Gates, chairman of the opposition group. Colorado wildlife deserves better. And yes, Proposition 127, Colorado voters Tuesday night split among rural and urban lines, came to the ballot box to reject Proposition 127, which would have banned hunting mountain lions and bobcats. You have to be very pleased with the results, Scott. I, I am. I was watching the election that night, and I was going out to the internet and Googling this this specific proposition on a consistent basis. And at one point, I saw that we were ahead on this by 11,000 votes. But then I, I wasn't exactly sure what the final tally was, but I actually looked that up this morning. It was quite overwhelming. It was people voting 1.5 million voted to turn this down, 1.2 million voted to ban hunting it was a 55 percent to 44 percent when all the dust settled in the end about 55 percent of the voters cast ballots against proposition 127 the first time since 1992 that colorado voters have rejected a wildlife ballot proposal i was a little surprised still uh, I'll be honest with you. I think if if anything to come from this, I think the uh, the message is loud and clear that the opposition is still pretty strong. 55%, you get a little over 1.2 million voters that voted in favor of this and just a little over 1.5 that voted against it. Boy, that tells you really how important it is for sportsmen to be involved. Absolutely. And not only sportsmen, it's interesting because I just got off a meeting with the organizers or the, the Colorado Wildlife Conservation Project, which is, again, a consortium of all the conservation groups throughout Colorado. A lot of them have national ties as well. But, you know, we are very pleased that this went in our favor. But the work is just starting. We've already heard that the organization that brought this ballot initiative is already working to present information to the Colorado Wildlife Commission. One of the things they're going to propose now is eliminating the use of dogs to hunt mountain lions, which if that happens, you're essentially banning mountain lion hunting. And again, this upcoming week, there's a wildlife commission meeting. The East Slope management plan for mountain lion and bobcat is going to be presented. From what I understand, the commission is going to be voting on this. So I, again, th this battle is not over. We are continuing to work as hunters and anglers and uh, this conservationist to really again reinforce this vote this vote is telling the public that we want our agency to manage wildlife some of this stuff in my opinion simply does not belong on a ballot it plays on people's emotions it takes the hands or, or it takes the management capabilities from our agency and it puts it in the hands of of voters and, uh, and quite frankly this is a an issue that people just do not understand the history is there in 2020 colorado voters narrowly approved proposition 114 directing colorado parks and wildlife to reintroduce gray wolves to western colorado and i think you're right i think uh, when you're using the ballot box uh, to make sound wildlife decisions you're misguided and, and you're right it's playing off of emotions and and there there has to be that effort that can be full force to be front and center to be able to bring the right information that's rooted in sound science for wildlife management, the biological impacts that has to be able to keep those management decisions rooted in science. And man, I, I got to tell you, I'm very happy with the results of this, but I think you hit on it. This is just the beginning. And, and this is, this does not mean you can rest that this is going to come and come again. And sportsmen and sportswomen need to recognize that. And, and it won't only be this state. It's, it'll be attempted in other states as well. In fact, I was just on a call with Dan Gates and again, listening uh, again, there are, we are already being contacted by other agencies, other sportsmen's groups outside of Colorado who want to know, okay, how, how did we get organized enough to beat this? And it's truly a great win for the conservation community, for the hunting and fishing industry. 
and, and so again i know that more of this will be coming across the country and again it's sort of a test state to see what could be done and again the voters rejected this and we are so thankful that this has happened and again part of that entire conversation that i just left in a previous conference call was about reaching out to the non-hunting public and really presenting our case about the benefits of hunting and conservation and how all this works and plays together and we got overwhelming support based on this ballot we again we won by 10.32 percentage points which seems to be small but that, that's actually a, a huge win in our minds that we have to continue this fight and continue to work towards conserving our wildlife part of that is is obviously hunting and we need to let our state agencies who have the knowledge and the expertise continue to do that. Scott, let's talk a little bit about the efforts that were put forth to organize this. This didn't happen overnight. There's been a an onslaught of people, an army, if you will, that answered this clarion call to be able to get out and get the right information in front of folks, encourage them to vote, encourage them to accept that responsibility of one vote truly does make a big difference. And when you add that up, yeah, 300,000 votes to the good on this, uh, if opposing this. But uh, boy, when you look at the population base of the front range, it could have easily swung the other way without a well-orchestrated strategy to to get folks to get out and understand this and take action. This started a long time ago, and let's talk about some of the efforts specifically with you and, and those that you have been able to recruit to help with this. Yeah, this all started in September of 2023 is when we first found out about this. And again, because of our involvement, and again, Muley Fanatic Foundation is a member of Colorado Wildlife Conservation Project. And again, I, for the past two years, have consistently attended the meetings. Um, we have weekly calls. And so just having myself and others just stay involved through these meetings to find out, okay, what exactly is going on has been a tremendous amount of effort. And, and again, we're seeing the benefits from it in terms of locally within our local Muley Fanatic Foundation volunteers. One of the things we did was we obviously raised, helped raise some money that we could help with advertising and again, educating public on the North American model of wildlife conservation. Again, there, there were tremendous efforts through large groups of organizations, and again, all working together. And then once we knew this was gonna be on the ballot because there was a there was an pro entire process where they had to get enough signatures to get this on the ballot. I saw that statistic earlier. It was like 147 signatures were verified to get this on the ballot. Boy, that isn't um, very many. I know, exactly. Once this, we knew this would get it on the ballot and it was assigned, Prop 127 was the number it was assigned. There was a huge effort to get a ground game going. And that's where where Muley Fanatic Foundation really got involved, including myself. We got a large number of yard signs, vehicle magnets, tailgate magnets, banners. And again, through the use of email, social media, again, we just started reaching out to all of our family, friends, colleagues, hunters or non-hunters. I was just gonna I, ask that. I know you and I have had some conversations, but I think it's worth sharing. Being able to reach those folks that are non-hunters and are, it's just not their bag, and that's okay. But to be able to get the opportunity to have the conversation, what kind of reception did you feel like you had with that? You know, I put together an email, and it was very comprehensive. And I, again, I sent it to essentially everybody I could think of or I could find in my, my address books. And I, I addressed it to non-hunters and hunters, family, friends, colleagues. And I got a lot of people replying to me, thanking me, because while the email was long and it contained tons of information, there were a lot of people who are not hunters who just don't understand the work that goes on in the hunting community as well as within the agency, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. They were astonished to find out all the effort that takes place to manage our wildlife. And so anyways, I got a lot of complimentary emails thanking me for shedding a light on this because they had no idea how to vote. And yeah, I got numerous responses from people, again, thanking me for basically educating them. And and, and I know that effort swayed many votes to of people to vote no. Yeah. So I'm very thankful that I took the time to get that done. This is important to me on a personal level, but it's also obviously important to, to hundreds and thousands of Colorado you know, sportsmen and women. And I know many of our volunteers did the same thing. They reached out to their family and friends and 
again, they were part of distributing yard signs, tailgate magnets, banners, all the groundwork that took place to make this to make this ballot initiative fail. Again, it was it was a lot of work for the past six weeks, but we were so thankful to see all this come our direction or our way on Tuesday night. Yeah, congratulations on that. I know there was an army of folks, and I know the involvement and the engagement you had to this was very genuine, very sincere, and you put a lot of blood and sweat and equity into this. But I'm curious, do you feel that the passing of Proposition 114 that allowed for the reintroduction of gray wolves to Western Colorado in 2020 and how narrowly that passed, less than 1%, do you think that played a role in rallying folks to make sure that they showed up this time. There were a lot of folks in 2020 that woke up going, I had no idea that was going to happen. And when it yeah, did, it, I think it was set off a red flag to folks like, oh, shoot, I better get in the game. It, it absolutely did. I think, again, going back to as early as 92, we had the spring bear hunting and ban as well as the use of dogs with bears. We've seen a population explosion of bears in the state. And then in 94, Trapping was outlawed in the state, the wolf reintroduction. As a result of these things, I think this initiative really woke up the hunting community as well as businesses. Even Bass Pro came out publicly in opposition to this. Obviously, there were hundreds of other businesses, but that one really... That resonated, uh, didn't it? Yeah, it resonated when you see advertisement from coming out from Bass Pro saying, vote no on, on Prop 127. I mean, it the entire, not only the hunting hunters and fishermen, but also the businesses that, that make money that are, that, that survive because of the hunting and fishing dollars. It, it was astonishing to see such a swell of support in opposition of this, of this amendment. Yeah. I use there the word swell. I, I truly believe that there was a swelling of Coloradans that stood up for science and sound wildlife management by voting against this. I am curious, Scott, For folks that aren't maybe familiar with this, if you just see the headlines, Proposition 127, prohibit big cat trophy hunting, let's talk about the implications if this would have passed and why this was strategically set up the way it was, because the implications are far bigger than what you just see in the headline. Yeah, exactly. I Again, I'm consistently getting emails from this. I'm still reading literature. One piece that I read this week estimated 156,000 deer are taking taken by mountain lions in this state every year versus 27,000 taken by hunters again in addition mountain lions obviously take bighorn sheep elk other forms of wildlife as well as livestock pets so the the implications of this to the overall the health of Colorado wildlife is was tremendous and I again I think people we got that message out and I think people really understand it Anyways, I hope that answers your question. But I, I think that's where I was Go going with this. Is I just want to make sure folks read between the lines when you see these type of things. And you you talk you use the word astonishing. I, I find it to be astonishing that it only took 147 signatures to make this a ballot box initiative. But exactly, that's um, what we're dealing with. And and that anti hunting community, they're smart, they're strategic, and they have a plan. And you got to be able to you got to get in their arena and you got to out strategize them because there's a lot of misinformation. And as you said, they were playing off of people's emotions. Yep, absolutely. I saw a few television commercials and I was just, I don't know, I was just disgusted with it because I... Oh, I I didn't see them, but I can imagine cute, cuddly kittens with Sarah McLaughlin singing in the background. You got to recognize that there is an underlying effort there that really has an impact well beyond the borders of Colorado. This is a direct attack against the hunting community and sound wildlife management. Absolutely. And honestly, it was an attack on ranching as well. It's uh, ranching and hunting in Colorado are just, they're just not looking in a positive manner from, from our state capital. You know, Denver, Colorado has, and you know, a lot of the people here are just, yeah, uh, the I, concrete I just don't jungle. understand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you live on that I-25 and put, corridor and everything that happens beyond that, you're just naive. Exactly. Not everyone, but that, that's how yeah, they absolutely. move these type of things. Yeah. Well, yeah. Exactly. Because of people aren't educated and what's really taking place, and then this stuff ends up on a ballot, again, they just don't thoroughly think through what they're really doing. And it, it's very shameful. And it's, like I said, it, it's going to be a continuous fight not only in Colorado but in other states. I'm just glad that we came out on the winning side of this one. Yeah. Um, but but as, as I mentioned, we have 
the East Slope management plan is going to be reviewed next week, a week from the next Thursday, Friday. And it's, and again, I know there will be a tremendous amount of people at that meeting, both, both supporters of 127, as well as the opposition to 127. We're going to be continuing this battle. And I, I just hope that legislature, the governor's office, the wildlife commission really look at this ballot initiative and look at the results of it and say, okay, we better start following the will of people and not divert from it. And th- and that's what's scary is, is when you're trying to put uh, wildlife management policies that are rooted in science, created by biologists, trained biologists, educated biologists that work within the entire ecosystem, and you put that in the hands of voters to be able to make these wildlife management policies, uh, you, you got a problem. I, I think folks, they need to recognize, because you're right, it smells like a rat. You're going to see this again. You're going to see this elsewhere. You may even see it on a ballot initiative where you live. You don't have to live in Colorado to recognize that this effort is out there and it will spread. But when you restrict the ability of the wildlife biologist to make science-based decisions, you're talking about upsetting the apple cart when you talk about biodiversity and ensuring sustainable ecosystems and how everything works within that. And you can't have that being based off emotion, off of cute kitties on television commercials or trying to make this out to be something it's not. Wildlife and, and our role in managing them as the top of the food chain, it's got to be rooted in science. Yeah, absolutely. And the introduction of, of wolves in the state happened last December. And I think in December of this year, again, there's going to be another delivery of, of wolves. And again, it's been, honestly, it's been a mess. It's been um, a disaster. Call it what it is. People who follow this and they see the headlines, there, there's so much of it that's hidden from the public that they're not even aware of what's really going on. So again, but but I also think that there is enough information out there, and again, people are really becoming in tune with all of the things that are taking place that impact our wildlife. And again, to if we have uncontrolled predators, which is what I that seems to be the goal here, is to get so many predators here that it really does impact our wildlife, and that therefore it's going to have impact on hunting and hunting dollars. And it's just it's a destruction of a way of life. It's really that simple. Yeah, well Um, said. You summed that up perfectly, I think. And This is a wake-up call. Folks need to realize that when you talk about wildlife management, uh, you got to talk about all the sciences, not just the biological sciences, but you have to talk about the social sciences and, in this case, the political sciences. And uh, that's a weapon, and it's being weaponized. And folks need to be aware of that and be ready to answer that call because it's coming again. Yep. Yeah, Scott. It's, thank it's you very much. much. I, I know you're you're on the way to to begin a little hunting. Just briefly, tell me what you got going. Yeah, I'm at my home, but I'm trying to get out the door. I've got a third season Colorado buck license and a third season bull license, and and we have a winter storm warning in Denver, and I'm trying to get to the West Slope. So it's it's been a hectic day. It's been a hectic week. Yeah. But I, I'm looking forward to just getting away and enjoying some time in the outdoors and. If I have some luck, it'll just be frosting on the cake at this point. That's right. Get out there and enjoy it. And uh, the rest of the election results, I, I assume you were pleased with? And most of them, yes. There's There were still, within Colorado, there were still some ballot initiatives. I had an initiative here that basically added 6.5% tax on any firearm or ammo that's sold in this state. And again, that one, again, because of the political climate here, I anticipated that would pass. But that one doesn't have nearly the impact, though, as... 127. So I'm really happy that 127 was defeated. Yeah, you had a ton of ballot initiatives in your state this year. Yeah, I think it was either 13 or 15. I can't remember, but yeah, I uh, yeah, I, I couldn't believe when I was trying to look up the results earlier on Tuesday to see if there was an early indication of where the pulse of the people were on Proposition 127. I couldn't believe how many other ballot propositions you had in front of you and. These, these are very interesting times, to say the least. It is. And uh, I hope that, again, there's talk with, within the conservation community to, to try to do some things to make these ballot initiatives, for, especially on wildlife, more difficult. You know, requiring a certain amount of signatures from every county in the state versus getting them all from the front range along the I-25 corridor. That, that would be obviously some, something that would be very helpful because 
again, when we have everybody here along the front range basically dictating what happens across the state, it's very harmful for the people who live on the western slope or who live in these rural areas. And yeah, getting on a soapbox here, but you, you mentioned the <laughs> yes. other ballot initiative that imposes a tax on the sale of firearms and ammunition. And I had looked at that on Tuesday when I seen that was also in the mix of several other propositions that were being proposed to voters. But gosh, six and a half percent state tax on the sale of firearms and ammunition with the proceeds going towards crime victims, services, mental health services, school security. So, yeah. You know, sportsmen and sportswomen, they gladly pay the Pittman Robertson's tax. You just don't even know it's there. It's there, but that money goes back onto the ground for wildlife management. And then when you start looping firearms and ammunition related to the hunting industry to, to start going to victim services and mental health services, it's, man, it's a far stretch. It's a far Absolutely. stretch. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Scott, I don't want to keep you anymore. You get on your ways, hit the beaten path, head west, and best of luck to you with your third season deer and elk tags. I look forward to hearing how that fared for you, and hopefully this weather that you have headed your way will will actually play to your favor. All right. Hey, thanks for calling me, and, yeah, I'm glad to report success in this ballot initiative. Um, again, we will we'll be talking. Until the next time, right? Exactly. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. You bet. Scott Hampel, Director of Operations for Muley Fanatic Foundation for the State of Colorado and very involved in Proposition 127 and the opposition of such. And we're just glad to see the results that we had with that. And thank you for everyone who stepped up and encouraged others to step up. And that wraps up another episode of Wild Things and Wild Places. But remember, the journey doesn't end here. Make sure you never miss out by subscribing. Whether you're listening to us on your favorite podcast platform, streaming us on our website, or following us on social media, subscribing is the best way to stay connected. Thank you for joining us, and stay tuned for more wild episodes. Everybody knows I'm a muley fanatic.